um, okay. the, the symposium and uh, okay. I'm just so I'm just going to over to organizers. Uh, <laughs> so over to organizers. Yeah, thank you, Dr. Myron. So we'll start today's. This is the ninth talk in our FBI series. So now I'll invite Dr. Ella Singh sir to tell you what actually FBR is and what we are at ACBR doing in terms of research and uh, give us you a brief idea. So yeah. Ella Singh sir, yeah, the so platform is for you now. Uh, so uh, good, good evening, everyone. My name is Dr. Lysomar Singh. It's my privilege to introduce ACBR. The Dr. B. R. Ambedkar Center for Biomedical Research that we formally call ACVR. It is a complete biomedical research institute, was seeded in 1991 and became fully operational in the year 1997. It in fact uh, stood as a role model to start biomedical based institutes uh, not only in the Delhi University but also in the entire country. ACVR runs masters. Uh, as well as doctorate courses in biomedical sciences with teaching and the research-based methods. I'm proud to say that more than 90% of the ACVR alumni go for research and other academic activities. ACVR alumni are pursuing careers as faculty, scientists, or in administrative positions, not only in India, but also in various countries. We also have a unique undergraduate research program under the banner SURP, S-U-R-P. Under this program, we invite applications from interested second, first and the second year undergraduate students of the country to pursue short research for two to three months. In addition to writing short thesis, we focus on giving hands-on training to the students uh, uh, and, uh, and also provides uh, uh, by students for sophisticated instrumentations uh, related to the projects and also provide platforms to interact with distinguished scientists in various subjects in the form of uh, seminars. All selected students are also given fellowships. ACVR also has several in-house fellowship schemes to support economically needy and meritorious students, including Zinn and S. Ganguly Educational Scholarship, Jawahar Bhavan Merit Main Scholarship, Professor Gurbak Singh Educational Fellowship, Professor S. to Educational Fellowships, etc. We are also proud to um, uh, to run Catstam Young program in collaboration with CSIR for several years that really helped to attract highly talented young minds of ACVR. In terms of research, ACVR contributes high impact on translational aspects. The translational impact is seen from the overall citations of our publications and our capability to transfer technologies for commercialization and the patent of various important molecules. SEVR has an H index of 25 at present and overall citation of our um, uh, complete publication is more than 21,000. We have several national and international patents to our credit and we have successfully transferred technology for Diagnostics of sexually transmitted diseases and recently SARS CoV 2 detection kit. ACBR focuses uh, on at least uh, four different research avenues. Uh, the, the first one is infectious disease and immunity, uh, neurodegeneration and neurobiology, molecular diagnostics and the drug discovery, and cancer. Under infectious disease and um, uh, immunity, some of the faculties are involved in studying post pathogen interactions, diagnosis and the pathogenesis of several human diseases, including malaria, TB, sexually transmitted diseases, urinary tract infection, and recently uh, SARS COVID 19 have also been initiated. Uh, under neurodegeneration and the neurobiology, we are involved in studying the basic uh, disease etiology and treatment of uh, diseases like Alzheimer's, Parkinson's, stroke, dementia, and epilepsy, etc. Under molecular diagnostic and the drug discovery, this involves the identification of new targets, screening of synthetic and the semi-synthetic natural products against the uh, STDs, cancer, urinary tract infection, and other infectious diseases. The focus is also on the development of 
drugs against neurodegenerative diseases and the validation of these drugs uh, in vitro, ad vivo, and the in vivo approaches. Uh, under cancer, ACBR also focuses on understanding the cancer pathogenesis, development of early diagnostics, and the treatment, etc. At present, ACBR is a small family consisting of only 12 faculties with firm intra collaborations, and we hope to grow uh, further strongly as uh, uh, Institute of Eminence in future. With these words, I welcome today's speaker, Dr. Myron, to disappear. Uh, now I hand over the baton to Dr. Minakshi Sarma. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you so much. Now I'll hand over the platform to Professor Brahman Suryaja so that she can introduce our speaker to all the participants here. Ma'am, over to you. Yeah, I will also add to what Professor uh, L.R. Singh has told is that very recently Delhi University has started a Delhi School of Public Health and ACBR has been given the responsibility to initiate the Delhi School of Public Health. In, um, uh, so we are it's a, at a very inception stage. Um, so we are just kind of, uh, you know, designing the courses and areas that we will be focusing on. So major focus will be on uh, molecular basis of epidemiology, drug designing and stuff like that, uh, system biology. Because we think that uh, we really need uh, these uh, modern tools now to study epidemiology. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, some of our faculty will be participating in uh, that also in Delhi School of Public Health. And uh, I'm currently uh, the joint director of the Delhi School of Public Health. So that is another uh, new thing that has been started uh, in Delhi University under institution of eminence uh, um, by, by Ministry of Education and Health. Uh, so with these uh, few words, uh, now I would like to introduce today's uh, uh, speaker, uh, Professor Myron uh, Christo Julius. He is a professor of bacteriology in the Faculty of Medicine, University of uh, Southampton. Um, professor Myron is actually a professor of bacteriology. I should not say he is working only on Neisseria. So he is he has broad interest in bacterial infections, both of human and animals, and uh, he has been also involved in vaccine development discovery of new antimicrobials. His main, uh, his other interest also lie in, uh, you know, um, developing vaccine for neglected um, tropical diseases. So very, uh, in, I, in fact, I was looking at his uh, publications and other things and I found he is also interested in looking at, you know, climate change and antimicrobial resistance, which sounds very interesting how the climate is, um, you know, affecting uh, all these antimicrobial uh, resistant patterns. So more re recently, of course, he is uh, involved in rapid diagnostic assay for development of COVID-19, diagnostic assays using microfluidic platforms, um, and, uh, you know, a variety of uh, current research interest. I can go on uh, uh, using his biodata he has lot of uh, very good, uh, great publication, excellent publications. And he has been uh, visiting fellow and uh, postdoctoral fellow at various institutes. And currently now he is uh, settled initially as a senior lecturer and then as reader of in bio bacteriology, molecular microbiology, University of Southampton uh, since 2012, um, he is there. And now, of course, I think in 2017, he became a professor uh, in, the, in the same department. Uh, so with the, this short uh, uh, introduction, I would like to invite uh, Dr. Myron Christo Dulitz for his talk and enlighten us on this uh, gonorrhea, which, is, which has really become a very hot area because we have a uh, lot of drug resistance in this bacteria 
it is in fact now called multi drug resistance and uh, during covid time i have learned at least in many countries there are several papers which says that the resistance in uh, in gonorrhea has increased mm. uh, apparently due to you know uh, people were not going to the opds and they were doing self medication that could be one of the reasons or maybe because we have been giving to the patient some uh, antibiotics even during covid to prevent secondary infections and that could be one of the another reason for increased antimicrobial resistance in several pathogens including gonorrhea in and neisseria gonorrhea i should say um so uh, i would like now professor myron to enlighten us on on his uh, on this thank uh, you Thank you, Damana. It's it's actually a real pleasure to uh, to be able to talk to you this this afternoon, um, and it's a real pity, to be honest, that, that I I'm not there in person because I was I had been planning for a year to to visit India and to come to see you in Delhi, but obviously that's had to be postponed for um, probably until the beginning of next year's, with our fingers crossed. So anyway, um, the talk I want to give today is is it's a sort of a broad overlook uh, on vaccines and antimicrobials and offer gonorrhea uh, and touching on some of the work that we've done in Southampton. Um, but also I want to show you just a little bit extra at the end of some of the other projects that we're also involved with outside of the, um, the bacteriology. But let me just show you first of all where I actually come from. So I actually come from London, but I work for the last 25 years or so in Southampton, which is a small, a, a small port city on the south coast. Um, it's a small city, population of about a quarter of a million, uh, and it still retains most of its medieval fortifications. And today it's mostly known as the home port for some of the biggest cruise liners in the world. And also it's the home port from which the HMS Titanic left on its fateful cruise in, um, in the early 20th century. So the reason I'm, one of the reasons I'm also giving this talk today is that I had been awarded with uh, Professor Damam a Hamid Foundation UK India AMR visiting professorship which runs for a year or two and which allows me to come and visit the University of Delhi and to try and form some collaborations. So this is the overview of my talk today. I want to give you a brief history of Neisseria gonorrhea and infection and some of our current work on antimicrobials and vaccines and then go on to look at other non-gonococcal work. So gonorrhea is one of these diseases that has been with humanity since antiquity. Rather like tuberculosis and leprosy, we've known of the existence of gonorrhea from the earliest recorded manuscripts in, hum in human literature. So the first mention of gonorrhea dates back to the Egyptians about 1500 to 3000 BC where in the Ebers Papyrus, which is now housed in Berlin, there is an exact precise description of gonorrhea, of pelvic disease, a urethral discharge, burning micturition, urination, and orchitis. Now, originally they thought that, well, maybe it's not gonorrhea, it's chlamydial infection. But in fact, chlamydial infection is slightly different because you don't have a pustular um, urethral discharge. And gonorrhea also finds a mention in the Bible and indeed in the book of Moses, the, Moses describes gonor gonorrhea as an infection within his military uh, camps and he is one of the very first people who understands the importance of quarantine and social distancing and isolation to prevent the transmission of infectious diseases. Hippocrates, the famous Greek historian and um, 
um, uh, clinician describes gonorrhea and calls it strangury. And Herodotus and Serranus also give descriptions of gonorrhea. And indeed, the first treatment that's ever uh, described for gonococcal infection is treating eye infection with topical application of olive oil. The, the Romans also have a history of describing gonococcal infection. And indeed, the word gonorrhea is attributed to Aelius Gallinus, the Roman, the Greco-Roman clinician. But he makes a mistake because he mistakes the discharge of urethral pus, which is classical gonorrhea, as semen. Hence, from the Greek, the two words gonos meaning semen and roia meaning flow, the semen flow gonorrhea. And Galen's hypo, um, uh, description of gonorrhea continues through the Middle Ages. And during the Middle Ages, there was also some confusion about the causation of gonorrhea, and it was often mistaken for syphilis. And it took the work of a Scottish clinician, Benjamin Bell, to actually distinguish the symptoms of syphilis and gonorrhea and identify them as separate diseases. And indeed, the, at the same time, there was a French clinician, Philippe Ricord, who supported Bell's conclusions. And he actually is the very first individual to recommend the application of silver nitrate for to prevent gonococcal conjunctivitis, the first recorded compound, uh, use of a compound for the treatment of gonococcal eye infection. So, the organism was first identified in 1879 by Albert Neisser, and it was grown in pure culture in 1885. And Cox postulates were identified, were confirmed in several human challenge studies in, in the late 1850s, where the organism was used to inoculate human volunteers. The volunteers produced a discharge and the, and the organism was recultured. And indeed, towards the end of the 19th century, there was a lot of experimental work which involved inoculating human volunteers with gonococci. And indeed, many of these experiments became controversial and very unethical, and they were eventually stopped. And this laid the, the, the foundation for establishing early consideration into medical and research ethics. So what do gonococci infect? They infect all the mucous membranes of the reproductive tract. They infect also the mouth, the throat, the eyes and the rectum. And if you don't treat gonorrhea, it can cause serious and permanent health problems in both women and men. And in particularly women, it can lead to systemic complications from ascending infection and leading to pelvic inflammatory disease, ectopic pregnancy, salpingitis, which is damage to the fallopian tubes, and infertility. And indeed, one could argue that we have lived constantly with a pandemic of gonococcal infection. We see 87 million cases worldwide and annually. Most of these cases occur in the least developed and low to middle income countries. And there are no effective vaccines. And as I'll show you in a moment, antimicrobial resistance is increasing dramatically. So what about treatments for gonorrhea? Well, the earliest treatments involve the use of um, metal compounds. So, for example, in the 15th century, there was a, a the time when uh, infected sailors were injected with mercury in the urethra. There were, uh, this was followed by the introduction of silver nitrate and colloidal silver. The first natural product compounds that were used for treating gonorrhea arrive in around 1859, and these are extracts of South American trees and plants. There's also the suggestion of the use of Listerine, 
which is um, a well-known mouthwash. This was originally developed as a, a floor cleaner and an antiseptic for surgery. Now, the basis of, of, the, of Listerine is actually, it's, um, it contains a lot of phenolic compounds, and those are responsible for the, for the bactericidal effect. Also, other metal compounds have been used, for example, arsenic, antimony, uh, bismuth, and even indeed gold. All of these have some effect, but they were clearly superseded by the introduction in the 1940s of penicillin. And the introduction of penicillin has a dramatic effect on reducing the number of cases and the sequelae associated with gonococcal infection. However, since the first introduction of, nice, of, gonor of uh, penicillin in the 1940s, Gonococca have now developed resistance to every single drug used to treat gonorrhea and every single class of compound used to treat gonorrhea. And now we're left with the last option, keftriaxone, and we've recently seen in the last five years or so the sporadic failures to treat pharyngeal gonorrhea and an emergence of keftriaxone resistance worldwide. The, the CDC in the United States recommends keftriaxone and azithromycin for treating gonorrhea. So that's a treatment of up to a milligram and, sorry, up to a gram of keftriaxone and two grams of azithromycin daily for seven days. In the United Kingdom, because we have high levels of azithromycin resistance, we now only recommend keftriaxone. This is still an effective regimen but it does not prevent resistance occurring. And indeed, the World Health Organization has put Neisseria gonorrhea, the kef resistance fluoroquinolone resistant bacteria, within the high category of organisms requiring the research and development of new antimicrobials and vaccines. So I just want to show you a little bit of the, of the work that we've done over the last two or three years at trying to develop some different antigonococcal compounds. And the first one that, that, that we published in last year was to try and develop something based on silver. So with a colleague of mine in chemistry and physics, we developed this compound that contained uh, a ligand 5 macapta 2 nitrobenzoic acid which was linked to the surface of very small 2 nanometer silver nanoclusters. So most of the literature which use, which develops silver nanoparticles for, as potential antimicrobials have a problem because they're developing nanoparticles which are very large in size, up to 100 to 200 nanometers. So essentially, they're also, they, they seem to be developing what's almost a colloid. But we were able to manufacture these small nanoclusters and then, tr and then compare them in parallel with keftriaxone to see if they can kill gonococci. And in fact, what we identified was that the, the silver nanoparticles rapidly kill gonorrhea, they're more effective than keftriaxone and silver nitrate, and a concentration of 0.467 micromolar is approximately an MIC100 value. So this concentration will kill 100% of the bacteria within an hour, and at least within three hours. So this graph, for example, shows you that the killing effect is very rapid, so we can get killing with increasing concentrations within 15 minutes. A cons the MIC concentration can kill between 10 to the 6 and 10 to the 7 bacteria within an hour. And they're also very stable compounds because we managed to keep them stored at four degrees in just simple PBSB buffer and then look at the bactericidal effect over time 
And when we stopped at six months, the compounds were still effective at killing the organism. We also tested the compound against a panel of resistant bacteria. These are from the CDC FDA gonococcal panel available in from the United States free of charge. And you can see that they have high MIC values to keftriaxone and azithromycin, but they are very susceptible to treatment with these silver nanoclusters. The nanoclusters as well, we did some preliminary experiments to look at toxicity and we don't find them to be toxic in um, one of the standard uh, cell cytotoxicity assays, um, even after treatment for up to 24 hours. So this is treating three different cell lines with the compound up to a high concentration of 58 micromolar, and you can see that the cells still remain viable. Now, the other experiments that we tried were, obviously, the first experiments were all with planktonic grown bacteria. So we wanted to ask the question, will these, will these particles kill bacteria that have actually formed a biofilm? So what we did is we infected some cell monolayers um, from the Chang conjunctival cells with gonococci for 24 to 48 hours and then, in, and then treated the, the, the biofilms with the various concentrations of the silver nanoclusters. And to, just to cut a long story short, what we found was that you needed a much greater concentration of the silver nanoclusters to kill the bacteria after they'd formed a biofilm. And that's essentially not unexpected. The second study that we undertook was with some colleagues in um, University of Kingston. And I think um, this is pr with Professor Laurie Snyder, who I think gave a talk to you as well a couple of weeks ago uh, on gonococcal genomics. So we worked together on a, sh on a small project looking at the effects of one of the compounds that she had been working with, which was a fatty acid derivative called monocaprin. So this is a monoglyceride of capric acid, and it's been shown in past studies to have antimicrobial activity against some viruses, bacteria, and yeast, but it had never been tested on gonococci. So what we did together was just some simple experiments, some, some dose response experiments, looking at the effects of monocaprin against gonococci, meningococci, uh, Staph aureus and also Pseudomonas. And what we find is that the fatty acid kills the gonococci and the meningococci very rapidly, very low concentrations, millimolar amounts, within two to five minutes. It, the other organisms, the Staph and the Pseudomonas, seem to be a bit more resistant, but with increasing concentrations and time, there, is, there seems to be a cytopathic effect. Now, the reason that uh, Laurie and I worked on the monocaprin was because we were trying to develop alternative treatments to the use of silver nitrate and topical antibiotics for treating eye infections, particularly in, um, in children born to mothers with um, gonorrhea. And then just to give you an overview of what our current antimicrobial work is, um, I have some colleagues in Brazil who are natural product chemists. And what they do is they try and isolate natural compounds from the marine and terrestrial biomes of Brazil. So this is from marine invertebrates, marine microorganisms, terrestrial invertebrates, terrestrial microorganisms and also plants and what we do is we we isolate these compounds and then test the compounds for microbiological activity against gonococci and also with some other multi-drug resistant bacteria 
I also have another collaboration with a company in the United States called Atomwise. And what they do is they develop inhibitors to enzymes or any other molecules within the microorganism that users can have identified as important targets for antimicrobials. So I've been doing some work with this company to try and develop and um, compounds that can target peptidoglycan synthesis enzymes of the gonococcus and they sent me two compound sets that we also that we tested against gonococci and i'll just show you some of the data that we've generated so this is um, a pre-screen of the natural compound set from my brazilian colleagues and so what we did is a simple standard broth microdilution assay and then we retain only the compounds which show killing of more than 50 percent of the microorganisms after 24 hours of incubation so you can see that what we will do now is focus our attention on these compounds and see um, if we can develop them further by um, chem re resynthesizing their chemistry and trying to improve their biological activity. And indeed, within this compound set here, we've already identified some compounds that are called chalcones, which in the previous literature has been have been shown to have biological activity against some other some multidrug resistant bacteria. And and this these are the two compound sets from the from Atomwise. And within the sets, we've identified already some compounds with promising activity against gonococci and we've done some additional studies and narrowed these down and are now focusing on three or four uh, enzyme inhibitors um, in order to try to improve their biological function. One of the other things that we've been working on is to also develop another model system for testing antimicrobials against gonococci and this is the work of one of my phd students and what she'd been doing is developing uh, an invertebrate model for testing antimicrobials using the greater wax moss galeria melanella now there is an enormous literature for that's used galeria melanella larvae the wax moth larvae as a potential model for looking at um, host pathogen interactions of bacteria yeast uh, and parasites and nobody had ever done anything with Neisseria and so we tr developed a model for looking at the interactions of Neisseria gonorrhea and also Neisseria meningitidis and this is basically what happens when you inf infect these larvae with, with gonococci. So these are the healthy larvae. These are larvae that are injected with various doses of, gon uh, of gonococci. And you get a dose-dependent uh, leth lethal effect over time. So the, so the organisms die. And then we can use the organisms to, to, uh, to test um, the efficacy of antimicrobials to prevent death. So for example, here are three gonococcal strains that we used to infect Galeria larvae. And then we treated the, the infected larvae with Keftriaxone and Azithromycin. And what you can see, this is healthy organisms, healthy larvae. These are uh, treated larvae. These are untreated larvae. Azithromycin, as, as we expected, did not save larvae from dying, whereas Keftriaxone, where you can see the, the asterisk uh, shows a statistically significant survival. The Keftriaxone is able to prevent the larvae from dying. And what we're doing at the moment is trying to use this model to examine the efficacy of 
of some of our new antimicrobials before we moved forward to doing any work in any animal models. Okay, so I will stop there with the antimicrobial work. So that's just a snapshot of some of the antimicrobial stuff that we've been doing. And I want to move on to talk a little bit about our work uh, and give you some background about gonorrhea vaccines. Now, the bottom line is there are no vaccines for Neisseria gonorrhea. There are no vaccines available today for treating gonococcal infection. And indeed, vaccine research has languished for decades. There has not been much research been going on. And this is essentially because the antimicrobials that we've been using have been effective. And also, there has been a priority from the research community in developing meningococcal vaccines, clearly because meningococcal infection is, is a life-threatening infection. So before the introduction of, of good, uh, effective meningococcal vaccines, we would have had half a million cases of meningococcal infection globally, most of it within Africa, with most of the deaths occurring in Africa. Now that meningococcal infection is no longer a real issue, the priority has turned back towards trying to develop a gonorrhea vaccine. And indeed, in 2015, the um, NIAID in the United States brought together a consortium of individuals from around the world to stimulate new research in developing gonococcal vaccines. And this new research dependent on using all the modern molecular methods that Professor Deman was talking about earlier, all the high throat uh, omics and the other molecular technologies to try and develop target antigens and target vaccines. So, however, there is a history in developing these vaccines and they've all failed. So there was a vaccine based on whole cells, pillus based vaccines and an isolated outer membrane pouring B vesicle vaccine. All of them essentially failed in real um, real time clinical trials in populations that were have with inf with gonococcal infection in the laboratory and in human challenge models the vaccines showed some efficacy but when you walk when you moved into the real human trials they weren't very effective so based on on this this get together in 2015, the research community decided that they asked the question, where are we going to find our antigens to try and develop a gonococcal vaccine? Because it's not easy. There is no natural immunity to gonococcal infection, unlike the immunity you get to meningococcal infection. Uh, the gonococcus is also immunosuppressive. Uh, and we really don't have an idea of what we could use as a potential correlate of immunity. Nevertheless, um, the decision was taken that the best place to look for a potential gonococcal vaccine antigen is actually within the outer membrane of the organism, because hypothetically those membrane antigens and also membrane uh, secreted antigens are potentially recognized by the immune system. And obviously a lot of work had been done on uh, the, the, the pouring of the gonococcus and also on the pillars and to some extent on the lipopolysaccharide. But the, what we decided to do was focus on two antigens um, one antigen called the adhesin complex protein, which has a homologue in Neisseria meningitidis, which we had already developed as a potential vaccine antigen in previous studies with meningococcal work. And the macrophage inhibitor protein, MIT protein, which we had also similarly done a lot of work with, with the meningococcus. 
So we published a paper in 2017 on the Neisseria ACP protein and actually identified this protein as the first lysozyme inhibitor in the genus Neisseria. And this is a classical C-type lysozyme. So it will cleave human lysozyme. And what we did was make uh, a recombinant protein, the recombinant gonococcal protein, and then answer the question, can we use this as a potential vaccine antigen to try and, and stimulate a protective immune response? This is the structure of ACP. So as I've said, it's a classical um, C-type lysozyme. And what we did, we looked at how conserved the gonococcal ACP was within Neisseria gonorrhea. And so we looked at the PUB MLST database, which at the moment has about four and a half thousand genome sequences for four and a half thousand isolates. And what we identified is that most of the isolates actually expressed only one of two um, alleles of Neisseria gonorrhea ACP. So the majority expressed, about 80% expressed one allele and 20% expressed another. And we looked at the, at the, at the levels of expression in, in a panel of gonococci. So this is 50 gonococcal isolates belonging to the, the CDC panel. And you can see there is some variation in the amount of protein expressed, but it's but we never found any um, any variants that were any mutations or or knockout variants or variants in which um, the protein was switched off. So it was essentially present in all of the isolates that we investigated. And so what we did, we made a recombinant protein, uh, two types, the mature protein, so we excised the, the N-terminal leader, and we also made a full-length protein, we kept the leader sequence, and then we injected mice with both of these recombinant proteins in liposomes on aluminium hydroxide, in liposomes that contained an, an exogenous adjuvant monophosphoryl lipid A, which is a TLR4 adjuvant. We also injected them in zwitergents. So this is zwitergent 314. So this forms a simple micelle for the delivery of, of the antigen and also in the micelles containing MPLA. And what we used as the readout was the production of bactericidal activity. So we know from, meningo from our meningococcal research that bactericidal activity is a correlate of immunity for meningococcal infection. So if you can generate antibody that are bactericidal in the presence of complement, you can lyse the bacteria. Now, the bactericidal activity hasn't been demonstrated as a correlate of protection or immunity for gonococcal infection at all. But our current thinking is that if at least we can develop an immune response, which is bactericidal, it's potentially promising for that antigen in future studies if we then try and develop a vaccine that also tries to, 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 to go down a Th1 route potentially. But anyway, what we did was injected the mice, took the serum, and then did a standard bactericidal assay. And in fact, what we could find is that the serum shows strong bactericidal activity against the wild type strain, against the strain producing another, the second allele of uh, ACP, and that when you knock out the protein, you get significantly reduced activity. So we could show that 
therefore that gonococcal ACP induces an immune response that, that has demonstrable bactericidal activity. And also those antibodies can inhibit the effect of, gon of the gonococcal protein in, 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 in reducing the activity of lysozyme. So in these experiments, we took lysozyme and when you treat it with um, gonococcal ACP, you get a reduction in lysozyme activity. If you add the anti-gonococcal antibody, you can inhibit that and restore the activity of the lysozyme. So we have a specific biological effect um, uh, reintroduced. Now, some other work that was recently published um, from colleagues of ours in New Zealand actually took another idea and, and um, this came from a retrospective study that, that they did and they asked the question or they looked at to see if whether vaccination with the meningococcal vaccine actually had an impact on gonorrhea in the population. And so they published a paper in the Lancet in 2017 in which they showed in a retrospective case control study that when they vaccinated their population with an outer membrane vesicle vaccine, the meningococcal vaccine, MENZP, which was used to control a clonal outbreak of meningococcal infection that they'd been suffering from in New Zealand, they actually found that there was a reduction in the number of cases of gonorrhea in, in the sexually active population of individuals 13, 15 to 30 years old, but not in chlamydia. And this reduction seemed to parallel findings that were also observed in Norway and Cuba after they introduced the meningococcal outer membrane vaccines in order to try and control clonal outbreaks. And the reduction was significant because what they found was a 30% reduction in the number of gonococcal cases in that population. And so the hypothesis was that perhaps there, is, there are some antigens within the meningococcal outer membrane that are shared with the gonococcal outer membrane and that this provides the cross-protective effect. Now, in 2020, there was a paper published in Vaccine by Semchenko uh, and his group in Australia, which actually showed that this was true for one antigen, which was called the Neisseria heparin binding antigen, NHBA. And NHB, NHBA is actually one of the components within the meningococcal vaccine. And it was interesting because we had been working for several years with some colleagues, with our collaborators at GlaxoSmithKline on another protein that was present in the meningococcal outer membrane called the macrophage infectivity potentiator protein, which is MIP. And MIP is found both in the meningococcal and gonococcal outer membrane. And we've shown already that you can generate an, a protective immune response using the MIP antigen um, of the meningococci. Uh, and this is what the antigen looks like. What it, it actually functions is as a peptidyl prolyl cis-trans isomerase. And most bacteria have several PP, PPIase enzymes, and many of them are actually located in the periplasm or in the cytoplasm. But this MIP is actually embedded within the outer leaflet of the outer membrane of the Neisseria. And so it, it, it locks in at the end terminus and it has on the, at the C terminus these two globular regions. Now there's a problem with this if you try to make a vaccine with this whole protein because 
these two globular regions show molecular mimicry with human uh, FKBP proteins. So if you try and immunize with the whole protein, you get you could potentially have um, an autoimmune response directed against these portions of the antigen. And so in order to get around this problem, what we did is we we made the proteins, we chopped off the C-terminal globular regions to just leave you the truncated protein. And what we showed is that if you vaccinate mice with the truncated protein, you can generate a protective immune response against meningococci. And so we then asked the question, okay, are these antibodies that react with the meningococcal MIP protein, do they also react with the gonococcal MIP protein? And can they also kill gonococci in a bactericidal manner? So what we did, first of all, was look to see how conserved the proteins were. And in fact, when you look at meningococcal MIP and gonococcal MIP in the BIGS database, so in all of those thousands of isolates, what you can actually find is that there is very good conservation in amino acid sequence between gonococcal and meningococcal MIPS of greater than 97%. So that was promising to start with. We also found that antibodies to the meningococcal MIP cross-reacted with the with outer membranes from um, gonococci, from two different strains of gonococci. They also reacted in Western blots with outer membranes. So here's the reactivity, outer membranes from gonococci. There's no reactivity against the knockouts. Here's the here's the uh, another gonococcal strain. So two hetero the homologous and heterologous strains, we have reactivity. And they also recognize the protein on the outer membrane of the gonococcus by flow cytometry. And most importantly, antibodies raised to the meningococcal MIP are also bactericidal against um, gonococci. So in this these experiments, we treat it, we, we use sera from mice injected with three different preparations of uh, MIP in liposomes and in liposomes with MPLA. So here's the activity against the homologous meningococcus, no activity against the knockout. And here is the cross reactivity against the gonococcal strain and no reactivity against the knockout. So therefore, we were able to show that antibodies that are generated against the meningococcal outer membrane protein, which has a homologue in the gonococcus, are bactericidal. So if I move away from what we've published to, to some recent work that we've been doing, in order to, talk, to expand our, our repertoire of potential vaccine antigens, we decided to go back and do some immunoproteomic studies of sera from patients that we had had in our freezer for many years. And these sera were from patients who had had uncomplicated gonorrhea. So, these were male and female patients who had urethritis or cervicitis. So this, this actually dates back to a study that my mentor, uh, Professor John Heckles, did way back in 1984. And, we, and in his original study, he had identified that there was an immune response to anti to proteins in the gonococcus, particularly the porin, the pilus, and the OPA proteins. And what we had in our freezer was the biorepository 
of serum samples from 20 patients. And so we did an immunoproteomic study in which we, we grew Neisseria gonorrhea, and then we did some isoelectric focusing of a whole cell lysate and an outer membrane preparation. And so we separated the, the proteins according to uh, charge and PI and then ran them on an STS page gel. So here is a proteome of the gonococcal lysate. And then we probed each one of of the we probed the lysates with each of the individual human sera and in comparison to some control sera from individuals who had never had gonococcal infection or who had never been vaccinated with a meningococcal vaccine so we removed the potential of a cross-reactive effect we were able to identify a certain number of bands pick the bands out from the gel, and then do some mass spectrometry. And what we found is that we were able to produce a reactivity pattern of 180 bands. And then obviously there's far too many bands to look at. So we had uh, inclusion and exclusion criteria. And our inclusion criteria was that we only selected the bands mass spectrometry from the gels in which there was an increase in expression of at least twofold between the patient sera and our control sera and what we did we ended up with 18 of these bands we did the mass spec we generated over a thousand protein hits from the amino acid sequences and then we went through an exhaustive computational prediction or cellular localization and function and ended up with the following data. So we were able to exclude over a thousand of these proteins because many of them were repetitive and cytoplasmic in origin. We retained 93 proteins which were broken down into 24 proteins which were from the outer membrane, three of them extracellular some of them are periplasmic and the periplasmic ones we retained just in case there were some proteins in there which might have been able to be flipped over into the outer membrane and then we had some unknown hypothetical proteins that were of potentially interesting so then we did another round of bioinformatics and we got rid of all of the inner membrane proteins, most of the periplasmic proteins, and any newly identified cytoplasmic proteins. And so finally, we ended up with a list of antigens which were identified by antibodies within the seria of these patients with uncomplicated gonorrhea. And the good thing was that many of these antigens have already been recognized by other researchers and published in the literature as potential vaccine antigens. So, for example, uh, we've got antigens like the multidrug efflux, transporter outer membrane proteins, PLQ, TONB, the lysozyme proteins, MLIC-C, Obviously, the porins, transferrin binding proteins, MET-Q, and also our adhesive complex protein. So what we did was make a decision not to investigate any of these proteins because they've already been studied and are in the literature. And this left us with 24 unique proteins which belong to the outer membrane or extracellular or they're a toxin relating and four of them are completely un un -hypoth hypothetical, and none of these 24 antiproteins have been tested for any functional activity uh, or as a potential vaccine antigen. So in summary, what we've done is identified a new set of antigens that we'll look at as potential vaccine antigens. 
And so what we want to do over the next two to three years is clone and express these proteins, investigate their biological function, uh, and see if we can induce um, a biological response, for example, serum bactericidal activity. So that's where we are at the moment. But I just wanted to finish with the vaccine story with a set of open questions that we really don't have the answers to uh, and really stand as roadblocks in our development to, for a gonococcal vaccine. And obviously the critical one is how do we identify the protective antigen? And so we have a lot of, a lot of different methodologies available. We actually don't know what a mechanism of protection could be, so we have no correlates of protection. Are we looking at an antibody-mediated response? Is there a cell-mediated immune response? Are we looking for Th1 type of responses, or are we looking for both? And then finally, how, we did, how do we deliver the vaccine antigen? Do we deliver them as a recombinant proteins? So at the moment, the community seems to think that a recombinant protein vaccine or maybe an outer membrane vesicle vaccine is the way to go forward. But all of these others, including virus-like particles or adenovirus-based delivery systems and DNA vaccines, these are all open to, to development. And so we're left with some key questions what, what is the goal of a gonococcal vaccine? Which is our target group to vaccinate? Uh, we need to have good antigen selection. Uh, we actually need to do some more human studies and to do some more human disease modeling. Uh, so at the moment, there is a, there is a well-established male gonorrhea um, infection model which has been used for vaccine studies, but there are plans to bring that back to look at more disease modeling. Uh, and obviously the, there's a strong emphasis now on the development of new antimicrobials. So that's where I want to leave the work that we're doing in with Neisseria gonorrhea and just finish off for five minutes just to tell you some of the other stuff that we've been doing in the lab with some of my other other um, collaborators across the university and also with my uh, some colleagues overseas. So one of the first things that, that we, we've been working on is, um, is actually doing some diagnostic assay development. And this is with some of my colleagues in, in physics. And we developed a new diagnostic test using uh, a novel um, a lateral flow and LFD platform uh, for visceral leishmaniasis. And so at the moment, what we're trying to do is do some clinical trials in Brazil and in Africa to see if this test is useful for diagnosing visceral leishmaniasis in patients with HIV. Uh, we also have a project with colleagues in Brazil trying to develop a vaccine for visceral leishmaniasis. So this is to try and develop uh, a vaccine that's also potentially effective for, for dogs as well as humans. So we published a couple of papers last year on a, on a T-cell epitope-based vaccine um, that seemed to work really well in our mouse models, and now we're translating them into, um, into a hamster model to see how effective they are before moving on to uh, a dog. I also have a project with colleagues in the United Kingdom at the University of Surrey, and this is slightly different. This is to try and develop vaccines for a spirochetal infection of pigs and poultry and humans. This is infection caused by the spirochete, a gram-negative spirochete, brachyspirophilicycline. 
Now, this is a big problem in the UK and in Australia, particularly for farmers of chickens and pigs. But there is strong evidence that it's also a zoonotic infection and can infect humans. And so we've published a paper looking at the genetic diversity of Pilosicillae. And at the moment, we've just submitted another paper uh, to, on, on a reverse vaccinology study to try and identify candidate antigens for uh, developing a, a Pilosicillae vaccine. So this is just an example of some of the animal um, vaccine studies that we've been involved in. Um, obviously, we couldn't we couldn't escape doing any work on SARS. And, and so over the so since the outbreak in in March last year in the United Kingdom, we had been working on trying to develop um, lateral flow devices and also an ELISA assay for SARS. Um, the lateral flow device assay is based on the nucleocapsid protein. And in our hands, the assay we've developed is as good, if not slightly better than the commercial assays that um, are currently available on the market. Um, but the problem we have at the moment is trying to find a, um, a commercial developer in order to roll out a test. Um, in fact, we, we actually do have um, our colleagues in, who developed the test with us in, in, um, in, uh, in uh, engineering, in our engineering department. They actually do have um, a commercial company collaborator in India, but the issue they have is that they can't manufacture the, the test to cost because the Chinese supplier of the monoclonal antibodies used for the test won't reduce their price. <laughs> so, so we're caught between a rock and a hard place. Um, what, is we, the, what is the specificity and sensitivity of your LFA, LFD assay? The LFD, um, uh, it's okay. at the bottom it comes here. Okay, 78 and 73 and 100. Yeah, so it's, 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 as, it's, it's as similar as the, um, as the commercial test we're currently using in yeah. the UK. Um, the, you can't beat the, the price of this Chinese kit. They are just throwing you, the price. I, I, I know, I know. It's, it's, but the quality it's is so poor, there is a lot of complaint, but... Mm. The, interest, the interesting thing is that um, the platform that the engineers use here, that um, they're actually able to improve the sensitivity of the of their LFDs by right, by reducing the constrictions in the in the flow channels. And so, what they actually did was take one of the commercial kits we have over here, which is made by Roche, and improve the sensitivity, but. I know, I know, Professor Daman. It's it's such a competitive market; it's almost impossible to launch a commercial product. So, uh, I mean, we'll end up just publishing a paper and leave it there, probably. <laughs> but, but the interesting thing is that I, um, my my colleagues in Brazil are also working on um, developing a test for trying to detect. Um, try to use urine as a marker for detection which i mean i have no idea if that will work or not uh, they haven't shown me any data yet but um but that'll be interesting to see uh, and i think yes i think i will leave it there so if i could just finally just mention some of the people that have been working on all of these different types of projects uh in southampton now, all of these people have been working in my group over many years, um, but my my current postdoc, Vicky, Vicky Humbert, she she has been working with me for many years now on meningococci and gonococci. She's moved on to work with SARS. She's worked with Leishmania. Uh, my colleagues in biological sciences who did 
all of our crystallography work uh, with our ACP protein and then our phys physicists and engineers who have been working on our small molecules and my colleagues in uh, Kingston and, and Bristol, New Zealand, and in particular, my friends in Brazil who, who I've been developing projects with on leishmaniasis and also recently with these natural product compounds as potential antimicrobials. And I think I've talked for a long time. Thank, thank you for your, 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 um, your, your endurance. And I'm happy to take any questions. Uh, Minakshi, may I start with a couple of questions? Yes, sir. Sure. Sure, sir. Yeah. Camera also. Okay. Yeah. Uh, good afternoon, uh, Professor Myron. This is not Hello. I'm, I'm a faculty at uh, ACBR. My own interest is in infectious diseases and host pathogen interaction for respiratory infection. I primarily okay. work in tuberculosis. So this was a fantastic mm -hmm. talk, and it couldn't have been come at a more appropriate time of uh, when we're battling with uh, finding drugs for SARS-CoV-2 and of course the other pathogens. You know, it was nice, a nice uh, break from constantly hearing about SARS and looking at something very totally different. So nice <laughs> and uh, kudos to the organizers for uh, like uh, having uh, invited you and you for gracefully accepting the same. Uh, I have a couple of questions and my, since my own field is immunology, uh, one is that uh, the two drugs that you talk about, uh, that is one is the uh, what is that uh, monocarpin and the other compound? Yeah. Have you that looking at uh, the combination therapy with the existing drugs, you might actually see a much better effect. Yes, that um, that is something that we were we were planning to do, um, and in fact, we we put that in a in a grant proposal to try combination therapy with with um, particularly with kefriaxone, but um, but we haven't we haven't done it yet. Um, the only disadvantage about these two these two particular compounds, the the silver nanoclusters and the monocaprin, is that they're only really useful for topical application. So, so the issue we faced was that um, systemically they're going to be no use at all. And in fact, what we are we are now currently thinking is that. The, the silver nanoclusters in particular, because they're so effective, is that we will we will pr perhaps present them as a, a sort of drug of last resort for topical treatment of wound infections. Okay. So, it, so in particular, we were thinking of, of moving on and looking at um, staph infections or, you, you know, uh, fasciitis and that sort of thing. Where they're, where they're, or, and pseudomonas infections, where they're likely to be effective rather than to try to develop in the systemic antimicrobials. Um, my, my current thinking is that for, for systemic use, for treating, you know, gonor just uncomplicated gonorrhea, we'll, we'll probably go down the line of, of these natural products because I've, we've got we've identified some of them which are really nice and which are non-toxic but we haven't moved on to any animal model to see how effective they are systemically so that's that's the sort of roadblock we have at the moment yeah, but sure. i actually but i absolutely agree with you um jaw, jaw therapy is 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 a way to go it's a way to try yeah yeah so that's that's what the people are trying for especially for the escape pathogens for having yeah. this amr so to have a, a adjunct therapy rather than simply change it completely to the new molecule. So related to this is the question of uh, Neisseria gonorrhea and also meningitis. They uh, occur as both you know, like intracellular, extracellular pathogens in the body. Or for it's a facultative intracellular. So I didn't, couldn't get the details of your bactericidal activity. But did you try it? Uh, whether either your natural compounds or your monocarpin, they actually work in an infected cell. Sorry, say that last bit again. I I you, I, I dropped yeah, out there. Say, so, yeah, so this, and uh, that uh, the other one, the natural compounds. Yeah. Do they work killing intracellular Neisseria gonorrhea? No, we because haven't. They, we haven't. Tres yeah. We haven't tested that yet. The only the only compound we know that does that does work um, 
well actually this is this might be potentially an issue the only compound we know that does work uh, intracellularly may be the silver nanoclusters but I think we do. We would not want silver nanocluster to be penetrating into a, uh, a mammalian cell. So, so right, I think it so, because yeah, so about forty percent of Neisseria occurs in intracellular regions. Yeah, yeah, that yeah. could be a challenge. With these it, it will. It would be a challenge. Yeah. So that's why I think um, uh, for 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 eventually, will any of these natural compounds. And some of them do, do have good bioactivity in vitro uh, when we move on to the to the cellular activity that is exactly one of the things that we will be looking at i mean we have the models already um you know the cell infection models already for looking at intracellular um it, you know intracellular activity so that wouldn't be a problem it's just a matter of finding the hands to do the experiments <laughs> Yeah, yeah another, another, Dr. Natarajan, in fact, that uh, we don't have a very good animal model also for Nyseria gonorrhoeae. No. And that is no. another another bottleneck yeah. in yeah. Uh, yeah. testing the drugs as well as the vaccines. Yeah. The, the, the only, that's another, another big uh, issue. Yeah. In the only, the only model from uh, Jackson. More transgenic from Jackson's? No. The only model I would actually probably recommend. Um, is the is well actually there's there's two models that that are commonly commonly used and probably are going to be used f are the um the, the mouse gonorrhea the intravaginal gonorrhea model so that's the model where you have to you have to prime the animals with with um with hormones in order to get a, uh, an infection and that's a short-lived infection but it's it's sufficiently long long lived over seven to ten days that you can look for clearance for example in vaccine studies and also in in uh, antibiotic studies so there's that mouse gonorrhea model which i think is going to be more increasingly used there's also a mouse conjunctivitis model which um which is uh which is run by Jerry Pierce at Harvard. Now he hasn't published his model yet, um, but I know of a study that hasn't been published, a vaccine study where they've used um, gonococcal outer membranes to tr to vaccinate mice, infect them with gonorrhea in the in the gonorrhea model and then look for the effect of clearance over time. And what you see is that you can get clearance. So, so the current thinking at the moment in terms of the pipeline and breaking the bottlenecks before you go to human, human, a human trial is that, yes, it would be nice to see bactericidal activity, whatever that means. More important, it would be nice to see clearance of infection in the mouse model and then you would move on to the male infection model uh that's that's the sort of pipeline that people are thinking at the moment one last one if i may be permitted sure. fire, fire away oh, no 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 and the, the target audience need to ask questions those are our students so this is uh i just took advantage of being a faculty <laughs> <laughs> So uh, the last one is uh, again an immunological question. You know, the serum uh, bactericidal activity that you talked about is it mediated primarily by IgA or IgG? It's so IgG. IgG. It's, try it, IgA. Mostly, it is it, in the mucosal. Yeah. In in our in our experiment in our experiments with the antigens that we had tested, we were looking at just IgG responses. So it's serum IgG complement mediated bactericidal effect you can do this you can find serum iga mediated responses bactericidal responses but it's a lot more difficult to do as a, as, a, as in the experiment for and, and we actually haven't done it ourselves but i know that colleagues in the united states do that and are more increasingly doing that as well they're looking for that iga response you're quite right Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah.
May I ask a question from Professor Myron? If I permit, Dr. Minakshi. Yes, ma'am, sure. Hello. I just, uh, Professor Myron, this is Pratibha working in the faculty at the SEBR. Although it's not my, uh, you know, uh, specific area of research, but then uh, organic compounds and their synthesis and, uh, you know, drug development, medicinal chemistry is my my part. So I just was uh, wondering that you showed a compound which is um, 5 thiophonitro benzoic acid, which is a highly acid, you know, very highly acidic compound. Did you screen all these, you know, because it has a very acidic nature. So that means then we are, you know, looking for something for the treatment of such kind of infection, you know, infections which are highly acidic in nature with the low pH. So do you look for these compounds in the, you know, um, in the in silico. There are so many, you know, uh, we have softwares whereby we can search for, you know, similar kind of a, you know, uh, uh, pharmacophore and then look for something better or maybe then that there is a possibility we need not even have the silver nanoparticles and we get the you know good compounds so, so. I, I i agree with you and when i come to when i when i make my visit to india i'm going to come and knock on your door okay um yes we 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 haven't done a lot of in silico work uh the only in silico work i've done is with with um with um with the, with the company collaborator in the united states looking at um the uh, you know the, the the enzymes as targets the the the, the ligand on the nanoclusters um these ligands are, are replaceable and and i know that my colleagues had um had been thinking i mean this was just a pilot this uh, the M the mbna ligand on the nanoclusters we we are just we decided to just try and have a go and obviously it worked but we the, and and we 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 understood we appreciated the charge issue as well and um, but what we wanted to do was actually replace that ligand and and try other things as well but we we just haven't got to that stage yet because to be honest with you i i'm still not sure whether the, the silver nanoclusters is a way to go i mean yeah, it's another thing I thought that because once, once you are doing the screening of this compound, it has a thio group in there. So normally, yeah, it's been reported that thio groups they have some kind of you know, to some of the people they might show some kind of allergies also. This is another thing which people are looking for the compounds which are better than the one which has a sulfur in there. So yeah. this is why yeah. I yes. thought just yeah. Yes. 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 So, I mean, I'm. You're, yeah, absolutely right. I mean, um, one of my one of my colleagues in Brazil is does a lot of in silico work, and um, he looks looking for drug drug the drug friendliness and um, and pains and uh, so yes, I mean these are things that we can do. Well, I'd just like to thank you so much, Professor Maran. Very encouraging talk the person like me who had been here in acvr for a long time still was not very much familiar about all the dr daman has even developed the kit also but you're thank you so basic about I'm, the talks i just um, i appreciate and thank you so much for the organizers that they invited you and you got agreed to give this talk awesome. Thanks a lot. Thank, thank, you. Thank, you. thank you thank you thank you thank you but, thank you, uh, thank you. But, uh, now, but i must confess but I must confess, I am in no way an expert uh, expert on drug delivery, drug design, and so on. I mean, yeah, I'm, sure. just, I'm just dipping my toes in and trying to learn as I go along. Okay. Yeah, sure. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thanks, Thank you. Lot, Professor Mary. So maybe when the COVID goes down, he might visit India. I will. Because yes, he, right. has, uh, he has got the travel fellowship as a visiting professor uh, to spend some time at Delhi University. ACBR, but unfortunately last year he he was awarded that, but uh, because of COVID, he couldn't uh, he couldn't come. But I think uh, it will be still valid, so maybe it is, in a couple of valid. months we might uh, you might be it, able to visit India. It, it it is still valid. Uh, yeah, Professor Duman, and many I, of these uh, they have increased the time period because of yes, these yes, unusual circumstances. Yes. yes. Exactly. Yes. In fact, they they contacted me last week uh, and uh, and asked me 
um, you know, uh, basically, uh, do we need to extend your, 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 your fellowship? And I said, yes, you do, because we can't, you're not allowing us to travel anywhere. So, so it's, ex it's extended into next year. So I, I keep my fingers Please. crossed that I, I will be here. Yeah, yeah. I'll be there shortly. So several faculty in our group uh, can really interact uh, who are working on different aspects, like Professor Natarajan, Professor Pratibha, Professor Madhu Chopra, and many young faculty like uh, Dr. Manish Minakshi. Uh, uh, they might be interested in forming some collaborations. Sure. Brilliant. Yes. Yeah. Thank you, Dr. Minakshi. Can yes, I ask? Yes, ma'am. That is what I was saying that you have raised your hand. Yes, ma'am. Thank you, Dr. Maran, for such a uh, lucid and nice talk. Uh, my question is related to the other compound uh, that is the monocaparine. Uh, you showed that it is having the antimicrobial activity. I think other for other organisms, they have already shown that it has antimicrobial activity. My concern is it is active in very high concentration up to millimolars. Yeah. And uh, what do you think? What is its mechanism of action? Is it a target specific or it's just a, it just goes in inside the membrane because it has a structure of fatty acids like that? Yeah. So exactly how it is? That. So what is the selectivity of this compound because it is a it's, natural product? Uh, say again, sorry. So what about the selectivity of this uh, for only microbial membrane over the other uh, membranes? Yes, I know that's that 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 is something that my collaborator is going to have to figure out. Um, she, she has she has a, she has a chemist working on that, um, but they haven't uh, they haven't published anything yet, or they haven't shown me any data. But you're absolutely right. I mean, th there is there is that potential issue of 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 just blending into all membranes not just yes. uh, prokaryotic ones yeah you're absolutely right yes okay and 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 i agree with you again as the concentrations are far too high yeah. i mean it's it's very rapidly acting it rapidly gets into the membranes but uh it's it's much too high the concentration mm -hmm. yeah okay thank you thank you for thank you thank you Oh, thank you, Dr. Marin. This is Dr. Aparna from ACBI. Although I'm not working on infectious disease, I'm working on non-infectious disease, but your lecture was very good. And I think the students might appreciate the way you started with the history and then, you know, okay. uh, development of uh, finding the bacteria and also the unethical way of testing it. So they know oh, how you know, the, the Human Ethics Committee and all they emerged yes. and then they started, you know, the experiments. So this, it was indeed very nice. And then you talked about antimicrobials and vaccines. So it was really uh, good to hear your talk. And now I, uh, we will take some questions from the students. Oh, uh, the I'm hard sure ones. these are very basic questions. Uh, so the one person is asking, uh, what is the mode of action of these silver nanoclusters? So basically the uh, mechanism of action of silver, you mean to say. How yeah. is it the, it's multifactorial. Um, in in our hands, the those those particular seven nanocl I mean, to the level that we studied, because we didn't do we didn't do detailed studies of mechanism. To the level we studied, we did, we we found that they they did have effect. They did have membrane effects. But if you look in the literature, you'll find that silver nanoclus silver nanoparticles are also able to generate reactive oxygen species as the main mechanism mode of action uh, for, 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 for the killing effect. So but but we, we only stopped at the level of seeing whether it had an effect on the membrane. Okay, so there's another question from the same person. He's Nilesh, probably he's very excited about it. Uh, and he's asking um, the proteins MIP and APC, which you are trying to develop vaccines against, are these proteins uh, directly involved in infection of gonorrhea or are these just helping the bacteria to evade the host immune system? That's a, that's a good question. Um, the ACP, the adhesin complex protein, is is a lysozyme inhibitor, so so it it will cleave lysozyme on on mucose on the mucosal surface. So it, it is 
it is evading an innate immune response yeah uh that will help the bacteria to colonize the mip protein is and the mip protein is interesting it's a because it's a ppias it i th i think what it is doing is providing molecular mimicry and and again providing potential for immune avoidance yeah absolutely right the trouble the trouble with gonococci is is that they are they can be immunosuppressive um and you don't get natural immunity so you can have you can be multiply infected over time the same individual can be infected over and over and over again So probably the last question is uh, why the outer membrane proteins have the highest potential for vaccine development. So that's a simple question. But, yeah. Right. It's because it's because the ones that our immune system sees most readily, and and it's the ones that are under immune pressure. So actually, probably the best candidate antigen of the gonococcal outer membrane, the same as with the meningococcal outer membrane is the outer membrane porin, the pore, the, the porin, pore B. The trouble is, pore B is so hypervariable that if you, most of the, um, the immune system is targeted towards the immunodominant loops that it's, because it's a transmembrane protein, there are two immunodominant loops and the immune system is targeted towards the apices right at the tip of those loops and it's hugely hyper variable but if you take a single pore in and you and you do an animal experiment you generate a huge immune response but it would only provide you a protective immune response against one allelic type and there are thousands of them The, um, and the other antigens that are important, I said, I think, are the ones that are secreted. So, so for example, um, uh, either secreted as for, as an ABC transporter, for example. So the um, so so NADA or which is the meningococcal one, NHBA, which is anchored in the membrane. Um, oh, all these other ones as well. Um, or proteins that are adhesins proteins that allow the gonococcus to stick to a cell so a receptor mediated interaction for example that will provide you a target either for for stopping binding so if you get an immune response that prevents the antigen binding then you can prevent you can stop colonization for example um, but most of these antigens are very very variable and that's been the difficulty. May I ask uh, one last question? Sure. Um, although it does not uh, directly relate to your uh, talk, but I have always wondered that, and in fact, it is our usual observation when we developed uh, the diagnostics for NG, almost, you know, 30% uh, population is co-infected with chlamydia yeah is there anything uh, known how does it facilitate uh, chlamydia to be also sustained in the infection or is it just a chance that both of them being in infectious agent for the same uh, part of the uh, genital yeah. tract and therefore it is just by chance that uh, co-infection is so common or is there any crosstalk or any help to each other in getting I, the co-infection? I don't know. I don't know the literature very well. I know there have been some in vitro studies um, trying to, to tease out a mechanism, a possible mechanism, whether um, gonococci and chlamydia um, a synergistic in their infection i i don't i honestly don't know um but you're absolutely right co-infection co is very common and in fact chlamydia infection is more common than gonococcal infection 
Um, I mean, it's a shame. I have a colleague here in Southampton, Professor Professor Ian Clark, who is a chlamydial expert. Um, yeah. But he's he's not here at the moment. But he'd be he may be the perfect person to answer that question. But to my knowledge, there is hardly any literature that's examined um, the the crosstalk of synergism between chlamydia okay. and gonococci. I mean, but we do know that. But 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 obviously, we do know that gonococcal infection increases the risk of transmission of HIV. Yes. And maybe it does the same for gonor for chlamydia, and maybe chlamydial infection does the same for gonorrhea. Yeah, like it is just that they kind of reduce the immune uh, uh, immunocompromise yeah. the patient, yeah. or is it just uh, you know some common pathway which kind of synergistically help each other to infect? Yeah, but there yeah. is there is uh, definitely. Some kind of you know crosstalk because oh, CT and yeah. NG you find so commonly so common. together yeah. that now at least in in India NACO gives uh, in uh, like the treatment for both simultaneously. Yeah. So they give uh, the antibiotics. Uh, so two antibiotics, uh, one for NG and CT, because it is presumed that if even if it is not there, it will come up uh, once the up. NG yeah. is kind of cleared. Uh, then we yeah. will be able to detect even residual amount of uh, um, infection with the CT. Yeah. So yeah, that makes perfect sense. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And, th and thankfully, there isn't a great problem with with chlamydial resistance to to antimicrobials, to antibiotics. Thank goodness. <laughs> So I don't think we have any questions. Any other questions from the faculties? If not, uh, then I will request Professor Natarajan uh, for the vote of thanks to our eminent speaker for an excellent talk. Professor Natarajan. Yes, uh, thank you, Aparna. Uh, Professor Myron, it was a pleasure hearing you. It, uh, the you. talk was delivered so beautifully, and you connected the right dots for the target audience. You gave them a very nice historical perspective of how this disease has, and the bacterium may not be at that, that time identified as a bacteria, but as a factor which actually affects. And then the most important part of the Moses' recognition of the value of quarantine, something that we have been yes, like, subjected absolutely. to for the last one and a half years. And, uh, Hope and pray that things can improve. And it was nice to hear you. You started with developing silver nanoparticles against this bacteria, works very beautifully and very important, not just in the cell lines, but also in the biofilm, which you know and mm. appreciate that, you know, like it's a major resistance to most drugs and vaccine that were reached yes. also. Yeah. Many, many of these IgG antibody molecules are also unable to reach the target epitope simply yeah. because of the presence of these vaccines and then very nicely you developed an invertebrate model for uh, studying this uh, bacterium because like as Professor Daman said that there is no uh, mammal models for this something you know like uh, a constraint having for uh, even the SARS-CoV-2 that we don't have a good mouse model for this the only one we have is the transgenic ACE2 receptor which yeah. is back on earth for so many months now from Jackson's and they have the patent so we can't do it. So exactly. we also talked about a very nice aspect of molecular mimicry that the students, I'm sure, appreciate that, you know, it's not just important to identify the uh, epitopes, but also ensure that you remove the epitopes, which will actually can trigger autoimmune responses. We also identified a, a mycobacteria protein, which has a very good uh, homology to the TLR uh, to death domain, by DAT to death domain. So this is also a very good aspect that you covered. And Are you, you also... So can I just interrupt? Are you a member of the Validate Network? No, not yet. No. Oh, okay. Oh, yeah. you need to sign up. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> I strongly recommend it. <laughs> sure, sure. <clears throat> I'll, we'll, we'll look into that. So you also looked into the zero convertibility of uh, like some of the like antigens that you talked about, and it it it, it was just so beautifully stitched and tailored for the target audience. Uh, me also oh, as I work with the uh, infections. It was uh, a real pleasure. So on behalf of the faculty, the university, and the audience, it is my immense pleasure and duty to thank you from all of us 
for a very insightful lecture and hope to see you in person yes, next yes. year as and when we, uh, we are able to get rid of our curtailed public call. Thank you so thank much for being with us. Well, today. no, thank you very much indeed. It's been it's been a real pleasure, uh, and uh, and I am really truly looking forward to returning to India, and uh, and and to coming um, the begin, hopefully for by the end of this year, beginning of next year, and uh, and uh, starting some collaborations. Hopefully, look forward to it. Really Lovely. Forward. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, great. Thank, thank you, you Dr. Myron. And, and I also thank want to thank Ravi, uh, who really connected yes. uh, uh, me to you. Uh, so mm. my student, PhD student, Ravi Kant, had uh, met him, Hello, and Ravi. he, he was, uh, Hello, he Hello, was uh, able to connect and uh, propose his name. And he very nicely he agreed to uh, to come and give a webinar uh, to. Uh, so thank you so much. Uh, uh, thank, you. thank you all. Thank you. Thank you, Ravi. Thank you, Professor Wyman. It was an excellent talk. And it's, it's lovely thank to you, see you up. Ma so we look Master forward Singh. to now having you in ACBR. Yeah. Yes. 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 I look forward. I look forward to coming. Yes. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. And everybody, everybody, take care. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. You Bye. too. Thank you.